Uh, before I introduce our panelists this evening, um, I would like to expend, extend a special thank you to the Mass Humanities and the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard uh, for their support of this project. Uh, this Housing as History program series has been nearly a year in the making and has relied heavily on the expertise of many people who have spent their careers uh, or lives involved in public and affordable housing issues in Boston. Uh, tonight we'll be learning about the origin and transformation of Orchard Gardens uh, and the development of the Innovative Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, or DSNI. Uh, we will then hear from our panelists with Carolyn Crockett, starting with a historical overview. Um, in each of our programs, we have tried to include the voices of a historian, an administrator, and a resident. Um, in this program, our historian is Carolyn Crockett. Uh, I first worth worked with Carolyn on a series of programs about the history of the Inner Belt back in April of 2012. So we've apparently been getting into mischief for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, since then, she's gone on to do amazing things, including publishing a book on the history of the Inner Belt. Um, she is currently a lecturer of public policy and urban planning at MIT. She earned her PhD in American studies uh, at Yale Universities. She also holds a Master of Science in Geography from the London School of Economics and a Master of Arts and Religion from the Yale Divinity School. Uh, prior to working at MIT, uh, she worked as the Director of Economic Policy and Research uh, for Mayor Walsh's Office of Economic Development. Um, our second panelist is Tony Hernandez. He is the director of the Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, a community land trust established by the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Roxbury uh, in the late 1980s. He grew up in the Dudley Street neighborhood and has lived uh, on, the, on the Dudley Land Trust along with his school-age daughter for the past 12 years. He has a master's degree in architecture and has played an integral role in community development and ensuring affordable housing for low-income families in his community. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Valerie Shelley. Uh, she is the president of the Orchard Gardens Tenants Council. Uh, she worked for many years at the Boston Public Schools uh, and is now semi-retired, uh, but apparently is still working on a consulting basis with them. She grew up in Orchard Park with her 13 siblings. Uh, although she did not live in the neighborhood continuously, she always had connections through family and friends who remained here. Her sister, Edna uh, Bino, uh, was very active in the efforts to resurrect the community and transform Orchard Park to Orchard Garden. When Edna became sick, Valerie started attending meetings to keep her informed, and after Edna passed, Valerie took up the mantle. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the chill. You are about to warm up. So I dedicate my remarks to the power of sweat equity tonight. It feels appropriate. It feels right, it feels kind of festive to think about sweating. Uh, my name is Carolyn Crockett. I'm so happy to be here to offer a few remarks on, uh, this, on this program. Really thank uh, all of you for being here and just really excited to share uh, just uh, an opportunity to think about, again, the power of sweat equity, the power of residence, the power of vision on the ground, how transformational that can be for a city that's in need of transformation. I am so honored to sit on this panel tonight, right here, uh, with Tony Hernandez and Valerie Shelley, legends in their own right. And it's true, I'll bring the hype, because they deserve it. So if we're going to talk about people who get it done, let's talk about these two people to my right. You can talk to me, someone who thinks about things that get done. But you can look at people who actually get it done. So that's who we represent. And just so excited to be able to have a little bit of a conversation with you tonight and to be able to just hear firsthand from the people who get it done. So my job is to try to set a little bit of context, to give a little bit of an overview, and to not fangirl out too much, because I am so excited about these people and these stories. I've spent probably now 20 years of my life and career really trying to understand how people make change, how difficult it can be, how transformational it can be for not just thinking about the past, but for imagining new kinds of future. So when we think about uh, this series, Housing as History, you know, the series could have just as easily been titled Home as History because uh, so much of these stories are about more than the quest for housing itself, but really about absolutely claiming and naming home in the city during uh, a period of upheaval, tumult, and displacement a time where no one was trying to really make home in the city and claim it, certainly not the government, 
certainly not anyone who was fleeing to the suburbs. So the people who were here in the city really put their shoulder to the wheel to figure out what that meant for them. And so this evening, I think we get to celebrate stories of triumph, um, how residents and their allies came together to use federal policy mechanisms to build a lasting example of home uh, according to their own visions. And so in the case of Orchard Gardens, Residents uh, used the Federal HOPE 6 program uh, to target uh, uh, their own vision for what home could be. Really trying to think through not just using HOPE 6 to think about a distressed area, but how could the HOPE 6 program be used to transform Orchard Park, Orchard Gardens into this new vision from Orchard Park to Orchard Gardens and what would that mean for folks who really were struggling to find home in the city. Uh, for DS and I, the, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution enshrines the power of eminent domain and would offer a transformative tool for reclaiming abandoned and sometimes vacant land parcels choking the neighborhood's health and sense of community. So these two examples of fight and neighborhood self-determination continue to inspire housing activists, scholars, students, and policymakers near and far, even as these organizations and these communities continue to push for a more sustainable path forward for their work today. And so I know that Tony and Michelle will share kind of where, where are we now? So I can take you back a little bit and sort of put, set you up for thinking, for thinking about moments of organizing intervention in the 90s and in the 80s. Uh, but this story stretches back a little bit farther than that, way farther back for sure. And I'll start to talk a little bit about what that means actually in the 50s and 60s. So can you grab that? Maybe this guy. Take you to the next slide and see what's here. So, an old story, but a familiar story perhaps. Let's see what we got. You all know this. This is a history series, of course. I have lots of historians in the room. We could do a little uh, name that photo. Of course, you all know we're looking at the West End, this textbook case of what not to do, of how not to develop land, how not to transform a neighborhood. So it makes sense to start there. So the West End, we all know the story of, of what it meant to do urban renewal in the bad old days. Uh, uh, the the uh, West End story is a story of clearance and destruction. So you're looking at a photo probably right before some of that destruction actually happened. So 1957, the city takes control of this area, tries to develop this plan. 1958, residents get these letters saying you've got to get out of here in the spring. Uh, by the fall, and, and then coming into Christmas, about 1,000 and 1,200 people were gone. And then the next year, we have this smear of dirt where essentially more than 15,000 people were displaced. And so when we look at it, we're reminded of not only what not to do, but we're, at, we're asking ourselves the question, where did all those people go? So we know that the story was immortalized with Herbert Ganz's urban villagers, and we kind of think about what it meant for a city at this moment that was trying to imagine a future for downtown, a future for transforming the city that was very much amplified by this vision of bringing other people into the city, but really clearing out the downtown core of residents who had been there for a very long time. So we see the example of displacement for a mixed race, uh, multi-ethnic community, uh, lots of Italian families there, Jewish families, some black families as well. And this question of, of urban renewal at this time in the 1950s and what that meant for the future, what that meant for Boston, was very much a cautionary tale for the ages. Uh, with the election uh, shortly then, of, of Mayor John Collins. John Collins would come in with a, a vision of a new Boston. So John Collins is mayor between 1960 and 1968. There's a picture of him with his lovely wife who has that nice little flowery hat. And they're greeting some residents of Haverhill, um, in many ways perhaps welcoming, welcoming them to Boston, saying, come here, it's great. 
And so Mayor Collins would be really uh, set up with this vision of, again, the new Boston, very much focused on the downtown core. And what was interesting about his, even his 1963 budget is that it really changes thinking about where services should go to focusing services and, and resources to downtown. So John Collins's term actually represents a turning from a focus on neighborhoods and during this period from 1963 forward, um, certainly into the 70s, and then we can talk about the 80s afterwards, what that would mean for a retraction of government resources and services to the neighborhoods that needed them most. Just at a time where the city is actually losing population in this period, Boston has a, a we get our population high point in 1950, about 800,000 people or more, and then during this time, we're losing people, mostly white people who are going out of the city, and we're seeing an increase of folks of color in some parts of the city, but Mayor Collins is not thinking about them, he's thinking about folks in Haverhill and how to get them to like um, himself and his lovely wife. And so the conversation here is a moment of change, a moment of disruption, a moment of clearance, a moment of highways for Boston and for other parts of the country. So you're looking at the cover of the Journal of the American Institute of Planners in uh, 1969, and it's right next to a rendering of what would have been the inner belt in I-95's uh, planned route through the heart of the city. So just as we're coming off the, the, the basically the, the tail of clearance in first the New York streets and then the West End, we're then hit with this plan for a highway. And how could that highway really set the, the city on a new kind of trajectory to bring more people into the city from the suburbs, to bring people through the city, and what would that mean for folks who are actually in the city? That has to be our constant question. So what you're looking at is the dotted lines of this map are, are proposing what the route of the highway would have been. So I spent some time thinking about this story, was lucky enough to roll that into a book for last year. So I won't dally here because I am slightly obsessed by this story because it's so important. But it tells us, it kind of gives a sense of literally the crosshairs. So when I look at the highway map, I almost see a crosshair as a kind of image that's on top of a map, giving us a sense of what would happen to actually the heart of the city. And so you see that little loop that's going through the core, it was called the inner belt, going through Boston, Brookline, Cumber Somerville, and Cambridge, and looping up north and then south, showing exactly what was the plan for bringing this road, what, what would have carried about 160,000 cars through the middle of the city. And so the question is, what do you do if where you live is being targeted by clearance, by displacement, and roads, what does that mean for the kind of vision that you might develop for your community and for yourself when it seems like the government um, and all of its apparatuses are actually putting your, you and your community in the crosshairs? And so in many cities across the country, there were these uprisings. Uh, this is a picture of of Detroit in 1967, uh, people really coming to a head around saying what is going on in the state of our city, uh, lots of racial, uh, lots of racial protests, a lot of unrest again because of clearance, because of destruction, and people really asking deep questions about what that means for the center of so many cities that are in need of investment, that are in need of political attention, and that are in need of, in our need of services, and so what do you do? So Mel King gives us an answer. And so out of Mel King's seminal work, Chain of Change, in 1981, Mel talks about the idea of community control, community control as a, as a political philosophy, poli uh, community control as a, as a tactic for pulling your community together in the face of a failed state, in the face of a disinterested government apparatus. And he says here, community control, a vision for the Boston black community since the 1960s, is not a simple idea. Uh, it means, in my mind, people taking responsibility for making decisions in their communities. On the one hand, this involves a collective approach to all community problems and issues working together. On the other hand, from a personal perspective, taking responsibility entails understanding that you have not made it until you can help others get to where you are or beyond. So a very different kind of vision for what it means to be in the city at this time, for what it means to take control of development. Mel King, as we know, a lifelong resident of the South End, whose family experienced displacement firsthand and clearance of the West End streets, but really takes his, uh, his political cue from displacement and change, turning that into a longer political career even, that is really asking us directly, 
who controls development and in whose interest and how is it that residents themselves can lead a new kind of vision. So coming out of this moment of clearance, of displacement, of urban renewal, really fast forwarding us not just into the 40s and 50s back there, but forward into the 70s. 80s, 90s, what would that mean for these communities that we're thinking about today? And honestly, really trying to take seriously the notion of community control as a new way to kind of take matters into your own hands. And so then we have this story, of course, building up out of the highway fight. So this, this fight to stop by 95, putting forward not just a rallying call for stopping a road, but a different set of values that we can see in this phrase, people before highways. So a demand, stopping the road, and a value proposition, people before highways, and what it means to actually take that through the 70s into the 80s into a different organizing uh, principle and orientation. The road itself, again, uh, I'll just point this out because it was so instrumental for so many organizations and organizers that were coming out of this time. This is a, a, a east-west alignment, you're actually looking eastward, uh, looking uh, on your left to the top, there's the Prudential, and this idea that this eight to 12 lane highway would come right through the city, right on the edge of where we are right now, not that far at all. And so just what that kind of monstrosity would look like, but what it meant politically for people that were in its wake. A protest, right, a huge protest for more than a dozen cities and towns would come forcing together, colliding, colliding on the steps of the state house, confronting poor old Governor Sargent who's there, who's trying to speak to this crowd that could not be any less interested in anything he has to say, but then really trying to use the power of organizing to say we have a different vision for what the future could be and we want you to stop this road. And the incredible uh, animating principle of taking control saying we have a new vision for what we want to do, enforcing the hand of government, in this, in this case, the, the hand of uh, Governor Sargent, to say we want something different for the city and for our neighborhoods, and if you can't get it done, we will work to get it done ourselves. This is an image from January 25th, 1969, when about 2,000 people showed up on the State House steps demanding an end of a road and for change. And so if you want to know more about that, there's a book I can offer you. But what's more important than the pitch for the book is actually what I learned about people trying to come together from across these different movements to say community control as an organizing principle and sort of a, as a guiding way to think through what to do when your community is not uh, is not receiving attention, not receiving investment from the state, from the feds, and what that would mean was significant. During this time I mentioned that the population is shifting in the city. And so what's interesting here is to think about what that would mean for the population in Roxbury. Although the overall city of Boston is losing population, primarily white population, uh, we can see from 1950 as a starting point through the 60s and 70s how as while the white population is decreasing, we're actually seeing a noted increase in black and African American presence in this neighborhood. And a lot of that would come from some of the displacement that folks were experiencing in other parts of the city, as well as migration from other parts of the country. So very interesting to think about this shifting demographic, what that would mean on the ground in terms of the racial composition of, of Roxbury, and how that would then translate into a different kind of, of organizing principle, as well as how people identified what was important to them. This is Jerry Robinson. She was an African-American woman whose family uh, settles in Roxbury, and she talks about what it means to be committed to place. Uh, this is part of the Neighborhood Voices Oral History Project that Roz Everdale has been leading, which has been amazing. Uh, and Jerry says uh, that when she came to the neighborhood, people were really asking her, you know, why would you want to be there? And so the beginning of this quote is her talking about the fact that she felt like if you really wanted to live in a place, that it was up to you to make us a community there. And she was really committed to that vision, even though people were, were asking her uh, why, why, why would she want to stay in a place like Roxbury? So what's amazing about the quote is she talks about the fact that there were so many vacant lots, that there was so much destruction and disinvestment, but instead of turning, making that to her turn away, that actually became a reason for her to commit herself more fully. Uh, and then she talks about all the, the fact that there was just so much arson. And so it's amazing to think about how she saw that as a reason, again, to, to more deeply put her roots there and how that would turn into her being in the neighborhood for so, so, so many years, right? 
And so this is sort of some of the image of what it would look like to be in the city, to be in Roxbury and in Dudley at this time, where so much of the neighborhood was under siege, where people talk about there's the sirens, people talk about the arson, people talk about the flames waking them up in the middle of the night, and that that was, um, if that wasn't enough to terrify you and run you away, that it made you think about a different kind of way of committing to the neighborhood and imagining the future. Just horrific images, but, but deeply moving in terms of, again, imagining what it would mean to live in this community while it was under assault, and how do you make a commitment through the 70s and through the 80s to actually sit forward with your neighbors and think about what a new kind of imagination could be for the future. More of that. And then a still image from... Uh, from holding ground, showing what was some of the result in Dudley of that level of, of not only arson, but also disinvestment and the vacancy that it left in the heart of the neighborhood. And so you, if you look uh, to the top of the image, you can see you're very close to downtown, almost within spitting image distance of some of these iconic buildings that we know, and to know that right in the heart of the city, literally the geographic center of the city, there's all this acreage that was empty and devastated from what had been a very densely settled neighborhood. And so on the heels of that, we also think about Orchard Park. Sort of Orchard Park, again, as a community of people who were in the city and trying to, uh, trying to hold ground, but really dealing with a very devastated real estate portfolio of BHA. Uh, Orchard Park would become Orchard Gardens, and that there is, new, there, is new there is new housing that was added to the neighborhood through this transformation, but that this, the, the, the community itself, built in, in 1942, had by the, the 70s and then certainly by the 80s and the 90s for sure, had experienced so much uh, vacancy in the, in the property itself of Orchard Park that people were really trying to, um, not only not trying to live there, but BHA was really trying to think through what could the future of this be. But honestly, really through the persistence and the organizing of residents, uh, certainly the leadership of Edna Bino, that this community begins to freely imagine not only what could be next, but to put pressure on the BHA to consider how the Federal Hope 6 program could be a way to bring a level of not only physical, but, so, but social transformation to the community. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from Michelle, kind of share some more reflections about what's happening there now today in, in Orchard Garden. But really the conversation is about how is it that a federal program that was really set up to imagine this uh, a, a platform about deconcentrating poverty, about turning low-income housing, often housing that was for very, very severely low-income communities, how was that program that in many ways was envisioned as a, a way to break up or to create sort of market or mixed income housing, whatever that would even mean, that the residents themselves could actually take the HOPE 6 program, fashion it in their own vision, and to imagine that to be a way to retain many low-income families, low, low-income families that would typically be dis displaced by the execution of a HOPE 6 program. And so really grateful for the opportunity to think a little bit about this case and what it means. I'm uh, really happy to be able to, to think about the scholarship of Larry Vale and Shoban Shom City, who took on this case of asking us to think about the policy implications of the HOPE 6 program in the case of Orchard Park and Orchard Gardens later, but in general. And raising up the question for what does it mean to actually house people who are very, very low income, and what is the way that public housing can actually be used as a solve and not just pointed to as a failed public policy vehicle. But what can it mean to really ask that hard question? And thanks to the leadership of, of people who are actually living in Orchard Park, tenants themselves and organizers forcing the hand of even BHA, I would say, forcing the hand of Hope Six administrators to really say we can fashion this housing and fashion this example in our own image so that people who are our neighbors who are living here now can stay here. It's so significant for us 
is that 85% of the housing uh, that was in the, in the rebuild of Orchard Gardens was maintained for low income residents, significant, and only 15% of the housing was allocated for market rate residents. This becomes important when we try to think about the future of public housing, not only here in Boston, but around the country, and how so many of these current projects are really about marketizing what had been uh, housing for very, very low income populations. And so we celebrate this example of Orchard Park and what that means now and into the future now, of course, Orchard Gardens, the new name. Um, this is what it looked like when it was built. Uh, this is actually later. This is a kind of 1930s style. The, we know that the development was built in 1942. And this image is taken from around, I think, 1993, actually, showing a little bit of the, the level of disinvestment, but also the level of vacancy. Yeah, so at this point, a lot of people had actually moved out, and there, there's, there's a conversation around how do you rebuild, but how do you transform the community so that the community's ties and the strength of the neighborhood that's already there could be built into the vision of that place. Of course, an image here of Edna Bino, who we'll hear more about, but Edna Bino as this incredible uh, voice of, of, of vision and voice of, of it sounds like tremendous uh, power to really say to the BHA, residents need to be at the table for thinking about what this rebuild can be, and we need to actually have a very strong understanding of what it means to retain many of the families who have been here, people who have been here through the hard times, what does it mean for those families to actually have the right to stay through what would be the good times, through actually taking this federal investment and turning into a community that people could be proud of and call their own. And so on the other side of that investment, this is what uh, Orchard Gardens would look like and would celebrate itself by uh, winning many, 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 many awards, right? I have a list of some of the awards here. I think there might be people who are in the audience from uh, the architecture form of DHK people here. No, I thought maybe some folks would be here. So um, if some people really talk, talk a lot about what this, what it actually looks like aesthetically. And I remember around the time when Orchard Gardens was finished, people said, well, what, what is this? What does it look like? Is it, is it like Candyland? <laughs> is, it like, um, is it like a suburb, but not? What it actually is? Uh, is, is the idea. And it's interesting to think about the fact that Ms. Bino was so adamant in the fact that it shouldn't be bricks and the fact that there was a desire to have the community of Orchard Gardens be uh, very similar or reflecting of the fact that there was so much wood frame housing in the neighborhood and people wanting that to be reflected in this new development and that there would be opportunities for families to gather um, on these porches, to gather inside, to have a yard, to have a door, and then there was like, a really strong vision behind each unit and each family having a door. Very, very different from this uh, earlier architecture of the 20th century, thinking about some of these, this modernist high style where you have uh, all these shared entrances and shared hallways. People really wanted to, to revert to something that they felt like was much more reflective of, of a sort of an individual family having access to outside and each other. And so the, the development won the Community Building by Design Ward, um, a HUD and AIA Center for Livable Communities designation. Uh, they also won the Builders' Choice a Design and Planning Award from the National Association of Home Builders. So lots of prizes, but it seems like the biggest award that's here is that feeling of pride and feeling of accomplishment and ownership that many folks who live there today and lived there before can speak to, which is significant. And so I think the last slide is just showing I think a snatch from that other earlier image that you saw in the video that's again showing you how close this land is to downtown. So then that's the, that's the point, I guess, of thinking about this visually in terms of where Orchard Gardens sits, where DSNI sits, on land that is right in the heart of the city, but land for so many years had been disinvested, had been ignored, um, had been literally dumped on and what that would mean for community members and residents themselves to push for uh, a new kind of, not just a strategy, but a vision that would include them. And these two examples using, again, federal policy, 
means, federal programs, federal resources to, to not only uh, make that vision come to light, but in the, in the, in the actual uh, grabbing of those policies, kind of remaking what eminent domain could be and could be used for, remaking what the HOPE 6 program could be and could be used for, and using that as a moment not only to be celebrated by planners and scholars and students, but also for us now in 2019 to really think about what is the possibility of sustaining these kinds of futures, what is the, the, the possibility of bringing them to scale, and what are the current needs that stand before these communities. And so thank you for your attention, uh, for this, uh, this chance to just not only think about the past, but think about where this, this puts us to today. And so I can't think of a better way to kind of offer a setup or a conversation for Tony to think to tell, talk with us a little bit about what's happening at DNI, but also what else is it that remains in terms of the work ahead. Yeah, thank you. Testing. Folks, see me okay? So, did you see the slides that I brought for tonight? Maybe. That's uh, one of them. Because you set me up real nice. Um, some of the slides are, are great for complementing some of the things that you mentioned. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Tony Hernandez. I serve as director for Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, the Community Land Trust, a subsidiary of DSNI, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. Um, and I would be remiss to not mention one of the pioneers of the DSNI movement in Ross Everdale, uh, a former deputy director of DSNI, and um, I admire Ross a lot, and she knows that. Um, so I had to give you a shout out, because I love you. Um, so folks, yes, uh, I currently manage the portfolio that resides under the Dudley Neighbors Incorporated umbrella, and so um, I won't dive too much into the history of DSNI to get to the to the DNI part of the story, but DNI won't exist without DSNI. DSNI was a, a number of resident-led um, groups um, that back then uh, fought for the disinvestment that was happening in the Dudley area. And so the mention of, of, of fires going on, folks collecting on the insurance to take those checks and just run off. They weren't planning on rebuilding their homes. They were just trying to figure out how to, how to cash in. Um, folks didn't want to invest in the neighborhood. There was a lot of illegal trash transfer stations. So folks who have seen the documentary see that there was a big fight for closing down illegal trash transfer stations back in the day. So it was a pretty disinvested area, um, kind of like a war zone when you drove through. And, and so through that fight and the residents coming together, <clears throat> um, you know, and, and pretty much, you know, kind of storming into the mayor's office at the time, Mayor Flynn and his, and, and his administration had granted uh, DSNI eminent domain over these parcels of land. So there were 1,300 empty parcels of land within what today we call the Dudley Triangle. And um, I think back to that time, I wasn't there in the moment, but I wonder if there was a moment where, you know, the organization got this huge victory of 1,300 empty parcels of land and in the same light, somebody had to say, holy crap, what are we going to do with 1,300 empty parcels of land in the neighborhood? Mind you, all these folks back then were all community organizers. Um, <clears throat> there weren't architects on board. There weren't developers. There weren't contractors, engineers, people who can understand how to read floor plans and, and be able to talk to talk and walk the walk. And so um, DS and I then created... DNI, Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, the Community Land Trust. They inherited the land trust model and brought people on board who hopefully were going to be able to talk the talk and walk the walk. Here you, here you have over 1,300 empty parcels of the land. What are we going to do with them? And so I'll show you some slides tonight of what has happened with um, all of those parcels of land. But <clears throat> the biggest piece of it was it was a huge victory in that we were able to get control of the land. That was the, the, the mission, right? And, in speaking with the mayor and his administration at the time, we not only want you to come into our neighborhood and help us figure out how to revitalize our neighborhood, but we want control of the land. We want to have a decision-making power of what happens. And for folks that have seen the documentary, we have one of our uh, still community leaders, Shea Madhum, asking city councilors, how many of you live in this neighborhood? <clears throat> and she says no one raised their hand at the time. So how were they able to make decisions on behalf of the community folks without having lived in the neighborhood? And so it was a slap in the face 
It was a slap in the face to not include the folks that were on the ground living each and every day in these neighborhoods and having other folks come in and make decisions for them. And so the community land trust model was implemented to be able to create this, this community voice and this community control. And so that was then physically built through, through DNI, Dudley Neighbors Incorporated. DNI and DSNI, uh, still today, 35 plus years later, are, are and will continue to be tied at the hip. Um, I focus on building the, the, the physical part of this community land trust and increasing the portfolio. Um, and DSNI continues to be that grassroots organizing arm that looks to attend to workforce development initiatives, healthy eating initiatives, youth, uh, youth work development. And I like to think of myself as the guy who just, uh, folks have heard the quote, build it and they will come. My goal is to build it so that we can then fill it with families that are deserving to live in these neighborhoods so that they can then um, build equity and wealth and successes in their lives to be able to, to live in the neighborhoods for as long as folks that are there now have. Um, I'll jump into some of the slides and you'll pardon me if I turn my back to you so that I can see the slides. So this is our, our DNI logo. Um, I won't dive too into it, I'll be happy offline to dive more into it, but the Community Land Trust model, this is a slide that pretty much talks about the, the quick ABCs of the, of the model itself. So in essence, Dudley Neighbors Incorporated will own the land. We will work with folks to build things on that land, in this case it'll be a home. And we will then work with the city and all the partners that are on the team to find a, a, a low income or moderate income family that will qualify for the homes and will connect them to the resources that are available for like down payment assistance. We get them you know, through the process of purchasing the home. Mind you, the home comes at a cost without the price of the land because we continue to own the land as the organization. So now the house becomes more affordable. They buy the home, we continue to own the land. The covenant that marries the two pieces together is what we call the ground lease. And so the ground lease we execute with the homeowners, our ground leases with the homeowners are good for 99 years. Um, they lease out the land. We continue to own the land, but we lease the land out to them as, as if they were real, tried and true homeowners. The only thing that they don't own is the land. However, they use it as if they did for those 99 years. The language of the ground lease has restrictions that prevents um, the home from going beyond market rate. Right? We want to keep it affordable for, for, for the lifetime of the property. So we build the language into the ground lease that puts some restrictions on the appraisal value of the home. There's an equity formula that keeps the appraisal value at a particular cap per year. And I can dive into the numbers um, offline if folks want. But the, uh, the goal of the equity formula is to keep it affordable um, over the period of time that they own it so that if, that if they, they decide to sell, then it's, a, it's affordable for the next family that wants to achieve home ownership. Um, and a lot of folks are skeptical about buying homes in the land trust because they're saying, well, Tony, where's the, where's the opportunity to make money on this? Um, there is an opportunity to make money on it. You're not going to make bank on the house because of the equity formula, but over time you will build wealth, you will build equity, you will build credit. And it, it, it affords a lot of opportunities, and I'll share a, a shorter story later about how that could be very true. Um, and so that's kind of the ABCs of how the land trust model works. DNI will own the land, we'll build something on top of it, and we'll create a ground lease that has language that creates an opportunity not only to keep it affordable, but now the land trust model, the way that it works when we get parcels of land onto the land trust is that we go through a series of community meetings to ask the community what they'd like to see built on these parcels of land. And so for the majority of the 30 plus years that DNI has existed, we've built a lot of low income housing on the land trust. We've dove into uh, middle income housing recently onto the land trust. We have farms, we have gardens, we have playgrounds in the portfolio, and we're starting to dive into commercial. Um, mind you though, all of that process has been guided by a community process. We have community meetings, and we ask folks to say, you know, to vote on what would you like to see happen on this site? And so then I, I then receive my marching orders as director and find ways to tie all these pieces together um, and take off my cap of director and try to play Cupid by making relationships happen between developers and city folks and programs and finding ways to subsidize the cost of making this a reality so we can then move these deserving families into these properties. 
This is a, a shot of uh, Alexander Street back in the day. Um, and because of the community land trust model, we've been able to do things like this. Right? I'll go back for dramatic effect on this one. As you can see, um, the community land trust model does have a purpose and it looks to achieve things. This is a, a site that um, uh, is not too far from our office. You can see, um, actually, Ross is probably a better guide for me on these pictures because she's our historian. But on this site, uh, as you can see back then, as to what it looks like now, you see the triple decker up in the corner. Um, same triple decker is still there. However, the city has taken this site and turned it into a park because we were able to, through the land trust, um, take ownership of those parcels and build community land trust homes practically all around. So at the time, I, I heard that the city was intending to build a community center on this site, but because we built all these home ownership opportunities around the site, they figured it was best to turn it into a beautiful park with a playground and a sprinkler system for the kids to enjoy. We have a lot of really good uh, street parties in this block, by the way. We close it down and families are sitting on their front porches, the kids are playing, the barbecues are going, right? What a concept of community happening. That's, it, it's a rare sight, but we are able to still achieve things like that um, because of the fact that the community land trust members pretty much reside around. And you guys saw a photo like this uh, that was clipped out of the, uh, out of the video earlier. Um, this is what it looks like now. And so, again, the opportunity for community control to have decision-making process and authority over what happens with the site is what has allowed DNI to achieve the success that it has. This is a, a map that I put together outlining what we call the Dudley Triangle, and inside the, the, the blue line um, is the 30-plus acres of portfolio that I'm in charge of currently managing and figuring out how to grow. Right, constantly looking for parcels of land that I can try to uh, buy so that I could pull that parcel of land out of the speculative market and out of the ugly teeth of the monster called gentrification. Um, and so that's the, the, the fight that I try to continue to fight on behalf of the community. All the colored blocks represent um, properties, farms, gardens, um, rental properties, at one point in time, all of those parcels were vacant lots, and today I've probably got less than a handful of parcels that have yet to, to fill out the triangle, but now we're starting to go beyond the Dudley Triangle um, because of the success that we've been able to achieve um, within the triangle. I had an MIT student do a, an internship for me. He really wanted to do his uh, master's thesis internship at DSNI, and he wanted to focus on the land trust. I said, well, why don't you focus on foreclosures um, for your thesis? And I'd like to know how many foreclosures have existed as far back as you can find the data. I won't read the data off to you folks as you can read it on, on the, uh, the slide, right? But the, but the big piece is that over a 21 year period, when you look at almost 500 foreclosures within a two and a half mile radius of, of the Dudley area, that only, what's the number that I'm looking at? Point 0.081% of that 494 foreclosures accounted for actual properties that sit on the land trust and our land trust homes. And so it was, in, it was a great research done by, by the grad student at MIT. And it's, it, it was very rewarding for him. I still email him and say, Lee, I'm still showing off your maps. Um, and so it's, it's such a really cool combination to, through the community land trust model, to exercise this idea of community control and having authority over the, over the decision making process, but the opportunity to weave in colleges and universities and taking talents that students are picking up throughout their courses and implementing them into real life. And so the interns that come to my office, you know, I, I, I like to let them know, walk away feeling very proud of yourself because you're contributing to real life matters. You're contributing to real life situations. And so maps like this I show off to be able to tell that story. Right? I can't prove 100% fact that the community land trust model is the, is the one size fits all cap and that it can solve all the problems. But when you crunch numbers like this, it makes a hell of an argument. It makes a hell of an argument. 
And so today's current portfolio, as you can see, this is our, our most current land trust map produced by uh, a student at, uh, a grad student at Tufts University who just left us and just got a nice cushy job in New York working for, an, uh, for, for another housing agency. She put this map together for me, um, who I'm very grateful to. And as you can see, the portfolio um, lists out what we have uh, on the land trust. I'll, I'll quickly go over. We've got 97 single family and uh, duplex homes, 130 affordable rental units. We have a 10,000 square foot greenhouse. We have multiple farms, we have community gardens. Uh, we just, over two years ago, um, through the Acquisitions Opportunity Program through the city of Boston, we were able to purchase the former Citizens Bank building in Upham's Corner. And so that was historic, in that we were able to purchase a building, and now that building resides under the, I call it the, the protective bubble of the community land trust model. One of our sustainable development committee members put it best, and I love to quote him, when I went through the process of, of purchasing the building after having gotten a green light from our board to, to purchase this, this property, he says, Tony, you know what's amazing is that for years we fought to, we always fight to have a seat at the table, to have a voice. And I love the fact that we're not sitting at this table, we own the table, mm -hmm. right? And I thought that was very powerful. Um, and I love to share that because it, it, it's historic for us in that we're, um, we've never had a commercial property. And this particular property is now tied to a really big um, project coming down the pipeline in Upham's Corner in collaboration with the city of Boston. And so it's a really big project. It's a big blip on the mayor's radar at this point in time. And here we are with one of the big puzzle pieces to this big revitalization opportunity in Upham's Corner to, to really have community impact and change for the community by the community. Um, a, a statement that has lost a lot of meaning in many projects, but because at least as, you know, the purposes of me existing as director for the community land trust and owning and managing this property is to follow the marching orders that the community wants to see. Um, and most importantly, uh, hundreds of families and thousands of community members have been impacted over the 30 plus years that DNI has been able to carry this portfolio. That was my last slide there. I don't want to take any more time because I want to hear you talk too. Um, but that's the, the quick and dirty elevator, long elevator ride of what DNI is about, why DSNI was created, right? Created DNI, and here we are um, trying to carry the mission forward and, and finding a way to implement community involvement in a process that just didn't happen before. Um, I come from an architectural background, I traveled the country working for an architectural firm for over 13 years. And when the opportunity came up to serve as director for, for DNI, you know, after some prayer, I made the decision to, to, to jump ship from, from the corporate sector to a nonprofit. And I don't regret the decision ever since because there was a tug in my heart about how do you give back to community through whatever talent you may particularly have. And for me, it was this, and here I am six years into it, um, finding ways to grow this portfolio and to create opportunity for families that can build wealth and equity. And well after I'm gone, the community land trust model will preserve these, these victories that we've been able to achieve. And so that's the goal in finding the right players to come to the table to contribute. We need the lawyers, we need the, the bankers, you know, we need uh, the attorneys, we need the community members. All the right folks have to be at the table and the concept that I like to use is that this is all one big chess match. Right? Without the right pieces and without moving the right pieces and being strategic about it, you're not going to achieve any victories. And so thankfully we've been able to put something together for 30 plus years through DNI, and, and that's the, the goal. The goal is to move that forward, um, not only from a physical perspective, but to also continue the community organizing perspective that, that we spoke about earlier. So um, I'm happy to answer questions later, but at this point I think I hand it off to Valerie. Good evening. As you all know, my name is Valerie Shelley. I am a resident of Orchard Gardens. I was actually an original resident of Orchard Park. I was born and raised there, along with my sister. And we, have, we came from a family of 14, same mother and father, which is a lot of people don't believe, but we had the same mother and father. Um, my mother never worked, but she did work because she had a lot of kids, so she did a lot of work. But my father worked in the Navy Yard when he came out of the service. And he stayed at the Charlestown Navy Yard 
until it closed in 1975. Um, and it's funny that he worked in Charlestown, because that's where I ended up going when I worked for the Boston Public Schools in 1981. I worked for the Boston Public Schools from 69 to 2009 when I retired. I keep saying I'm retired, but nobody believes me. I, I am now consulting for Charlestown High because nobody wants to handle substitutes. <laughs> nobody wants to cover the building when teachers are out. And I've been doing it so long, like it's just, just like waking up in the morning. So that's what I do with that, as a consultant for Charlestown High. And I actually can do that from my bedroom on the computer. Um, I'm up early, but I'm an early riser anyway. Um, and I only say that to say that what comes around goes around. I talked about my father because he worked in Charlestown. And in 1981, if you all remember during the busing, Charlestown was not the place to be. But there I was, smack in the middle of Charlestown, and never had a problem. Never, ever had a problem. And I think the reason I never had a problem, because I communicated with people. I didn't talk at them. I didn't ignore them. I had a conversation. And I listened, and I heard what they had to say. And I gave them back answers. That I, and if I didn't have the answer, I found it. And I found that's what, I think the city made the mistake, well, they made several mistakes. But one of the mistakes they made with busing was the way they did it. When you're busing students away from their communities, you don't start in a high school where they've been going all their lives. You start at elementary. If they had to start in an elementary school, say from K to three, and let those kids move up, it might have worked. But that wasn't their goal. Their goal was never for Boston to work. If anybody knows anything about, I don't know how many people here from Boston, that was not, that was to divide the city, which they did. And it, when it worked in the schools, it affected the housing. And I'm getting back to the housing because that's when the developments started to period, and people started moving out. Um, the city changed, they were not given money, and people blame BHA for not taking care of the developments. It was the government not giving money to these housing authorities for them to take care of their residents. Because Boston Housing and any other housing development makes money from rents. But rents does not take care of buildings. You need resources for that, and that money comes from the government and the cities, and they didn't give that money. Um, and I say that to say that the residents that stayed at Orchard Park, and my sister, God bless her, I don't know how she did it, I used to walk through that, come down that street and look at that building and say, what am I doing here? God, why does she stay here? I mean, in those buildings, um, <clears throat> they had, so it was three flights, four, four apartments, three flights. So it was 12 apartments in each building. In her building, she was on the third floor. There was a family on the second floor and a family on the first floor. Three people, three, three families in the 12 apartment building. And then you go to the building across from her, which was completely empty. You might find four in another building, and that's how it was scattered throughout. And I said to her, why do you keep, they are not moving me out of here. I will tear down every brick and I will still be here. <laughs> and um, what happened was, when she called and told me she was going to Washington, I said, what are you going to Washington for? You can't even get to Dudley. How are you going to Washington? <laughs> and she said, we're going for the Hope Six Grant. Maybe I told you, what are you talking about, Ed? And I had no idea, because she talks a lot, so I didn't pay no mind. <laughs> So she said, we're going to the, get a, a go for the Hope Six grant. And Bill McGonigal's go. I said, Bill McGonigal? I said, ain't that the guy from BHA? She said, yeah, that's my buddy. 
She said, we're going, he's going to go with me, we're going to go for the Hope Six Grant. I said, okay, good luck, good luck. She said, now take care and watch out for my kids. I said, the kids are all teenagers and I'm supposed to watch out for them. I said, okay, I'll check on them. So she goes and she comes back and she says, I think we got, I said, what, you got what? Because I had no idea what a Hope Six Grant was. I'm just, yeah, okay, so you got a grant. You had to go all the way to Washington to get a grant. She said, Dolly, you don't know what that grant is. They're going to redo the whole watch it pop. I said, okay, Edna, I'll see it when I believe it. <laughs> Did I ever believe it? And she kept saying to me, you got to move back. you got to move back. I said, I'm not coming back to Orchard Park. She said, no, we're changing the name. We're ch the whole thing's going to change. I said, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. Well, I believed it when I saw it. When I saw them building, I said, Edna, where all these colors come from? She said, it's going to be every color I can think of. There will be no bricks. We're going to have backyards. Nice to walk through there. I said, my God, what is this place? Of course, I picked up my little unit. I had my little corner. I knew which one I wanted. Um, and at that time, the same people that were managing were managing where I lived in Haynes House at Madison Park Village. So it was an easy transfer. So I didn't even have to go through all the the who knows who, I've been there for 15, 20 years, so I just transferred over to Orchard. And it was the best thing I ever did. Not knowing she was going to get sick, because I was into education, she was into social services and community work. She said, I need you to come, come to this meeting. I said, look, Edna, I'm up at 4 in the morning. I do not have time to go to meetings from 6 to 8 o'clock. You know you need to come. You need to find out what we're doing in this development. But I didn't know she was getting sick at that time. She never told me. So then I went to one of the meetings with her, and I saw a couple of people I knew, and we talked. And then I realized what they were actually doing in those meetings and how strong those residents cared about their development. I said, and you got a good thing going here. you got a lot of residents that really care about Orchard. She said, I've been trying to tell you that. I've been trying to tell you that. You need it. They need your mouth. You got a bigger mouth than I do. They'll listen to you. I said, okay, I'll, I'll start coming. So I started going to the meetings. Then when I found out she was sick, I knew I really had to pick up. Um, and then when she passed, uh, I promised her that I would keep up. I didn't know I was going to take on as much as I did, but I told her I would keep her blessed of what's going on in the neighborhood. I ended up getting invited to one of the board meetings. I attended the board meeting. They asked me to join. I joined. I was secretary. This is the way they get you in. You know, they get you in the door. You become secretary and you take good notes. You know, and you keep everybody abreast. Next thing you know, you're president. And I'm like, I woke up one day. I said to myself, how did that happen? I said, how did I become she said, oh, that's what they wanted all the time. But that's what happened. So I am, I have been president now for the last eight years. Yeah, about eight years now. Um, and unfortunately, the community has changed that I'm having difficulty getting residents out like we used to have. We don't have resident meetings like we used to have. Um, so me, my week, my board went from 12 members and we're down to six that come on a regular basis. So we now have a six board meet. So what we decided to do was to do door knocking. We got these little um, plastic things that stick on your refrigerator with the board on it, the numbers, everybody's number. If you have an emergency, you can call this number. So we're going to go around and knock on every resident's door, hand them this little thing they can put on their refrigerator, and, and ask them what their needs are, what they see as their needs are. Um, hopefully, we might get 20 residents to come out. You get 20, then you get 40, because they bring somebody else. Um, but it's funny that they don't come to meetings. But when you have functions, <laughs> God. <laughs> we have a back to school jamboree. We used to be Unity Day, but we changed it to our back to school jamboree because we give our backpacks. 
Well, it started, this was our 13th. And we used to get about 100, 150 kids. That place is so packed. It's like 500 people there all day. They don't leave because we give up the backpacks at the end. So they do not leave. But it's a great time. And you see the residents that come out. We even get, we invite the surrounding communities too. Uh, we just don't invite the orchard kids because there were a lot of kids around the surrounding community. Um, so we invite kids around the surrounding community. And every kid goes home with a backpack. And I always say, anybody interested in coming to me, just sign up here. You give them the sign, but they don't come. So this is one of the ways that um, I'm trying to get residents to come out. And part of the work I do, I just don't do orchard um, on the wrap for BHA, which is Resident Advisory Board for the Boston Housing Authority. And I work with other developments because we're all having the same type of problems. But I'd like to talk to you guys because what my sister did with the HOPE 6 grant, the government is not giving out HOPE 6 money anymore. Matter of fact, they're not giving any money to public housing anywhere. So now what they're doing is they're forcing housing developments to look for money elsewhere. So now they're coming up with this called RAD, where people now, the, the developments buy into RAD, the residents become Section 8 residents. They no longer become Boston housing residents, they become Section 8 residents. And I'm, that all sounds good to people, it doesn't sound good to me, because that scares me. Because Section 8 is not something that's going to be a lifelong thing. BHA was a lifelong thing. So I asked a question when I went to a conference in Washington. This RAD, when these people change to Section 8, how long is this guaranteed for? And they said, well, they have an option to take the Section 8 certificate and move away from the development. I said, where are they moving to? How, people aren't taking them in their homes. The Section 8 homes, now, they might take you, but they can move you anytime they want. So my question is, how safe is that Section 8? And I need to get residents to understand. They all sound good. I'm like, well, I got a Section 8 certificate. But that Section 8 certificate don't belong to you. It belongs to your apartment or your unit. And I, 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 I got to get people to understand that. And I'm trying to get people to vote so we can get these people that are in office, support housing, so money to put more in housing, so we can afford to live where we live and not get moved out because I'm afraid of regentrification. Because if anybody knows, Roxbury has changed from the time I was born until now. Who wanted to come to Dudley? People would not come nowhere near Dudley. Now you can't keep them away from Dudley. They're all over the place, which is fine with me, but don't try to move me out because you want to come in. I'm welcoming you, but don't move us because you want a piece of the pie. We can all share the piece of the pie, but we got to do it together and not by moving other people out. So if you all have any resources to help me do this, please contact me at Orchard Gardens. Just call Orchard Gardens, Laugh and Val Shelley, they'll find me. Um, I don't know what else to say other than I could kick my sister because I'm supposed to be retired. I said I was going to travel. I was going to read some books. I got books like this. I can't even get into. You start a book and then your phone rings and you got a meeting and you never finish it. Um, but it keeps me young. It keeps me going. Um, and also, I don't want to get hit upside the head because that's what she'll do. I know she'll wake me up. Girl, get up and go. Um, but I, I, I get, the way I get my rewards is when I see residents that thank me, kids that I had, oh God, months, years ago, some of them look older than me, will stop me in the street and say, Val, you look great. Oh my God, 
You don't know what you did? I, no. Oh, I remember. Don't you think I don't remember you? <laughs> but it, the impact that you have on people, you never realize until you hear from them. And it's amazing. I get amazed every time I hear a story, and I'm like, did I really do that? I guess I really do have impact on people. So, And this is why I continue to do what I do. And I'm going to continue to do what I do. Even if I got to get two of these. I'm going to continue to do what I do. Um, so if anybody has any questions, anything on housing, education, I'm gang. The question he asked was, um, recently there's a, a movement to change Dudley Station to Nubian Station. Now, I had a group came to me about a year ago. Because anything that happens in near Dudley or around Orchard, the city tells them to call me. Because if they don't call me and I'll hear about it later, I'm calling them. What is going on? So everybody calls me. So they came to meet with me and they asked, um, talk about they wanted to change Dudley Station to Nubian. I said, why? And they said, well, he was um, into the slaves. I said, yeah. I said, quite a few people were into slaves. What's that got to do with Dudley Station? And they said, well, we don't want an I said, excuse me, you don't even live down here. I said, I don't understand, listen, that's history. And we have to live with our history. So the man was part of slavery. <laughs> Who knows how many slaves we had in our family? I don't know. But that's not where I live now. I live in Dudley Station, been Dudley Station. I'm 71 years old and was Dudley Station when I was born. And God forbid it be Dudley Station when I die, because I am not changing it. And I'm not, I'm against changing it. And I'm so glad that the vote didn't go through. Because most of the people that want to change the Nubian, I don't even think they realize. All of a sudden, everybody wants these things changed. That's history. I'm sorry. That's history. Why change his? That's part. So you teach people why that was named then, and then you move on and say, here where we are now. Otherwise, what, what's, what happened to the history? Do we erase everybody that had a slave? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Would some of us be here if our slaves weren't here? Come on, let's be real. So I was, I was definitely against that. And I don't know where everybody on my board was, because I was, but it didn't go through it, Orchard. Michelle, you have a question about the, the houses, the replacement and what your sister was thinking when she, could you talk about she didn't want the bricks and why she liked? The colors? The colors, but okay. also the, the house look. And okay, uh, uh, let me, uh, how can I explain this? The, back then when she was there and there was only so many people in the unit, that was a very depressing area. Very, I hated going down there. I don't know, I didn't know how she, you walk in the house, you never know she lived in the project. And that's what she always said. I open my door, I don't live in the bricks. I live in my house. And that's how the, the mentality I had to get. It's not what's outside, it's what's on the inside that counts. And I had to learn that. But I understood her reasoning was that she never wanted to see bricks again. And she wanted people to have backyards and places to sit and barbecue and have friends over and have your own space. Um, and I understood that. Now the colors like threw me for a loop when I first saw them. But it made a lot of sense because when I worked in the school, when I started in the school department, I started at the David A. Ellis, and then I went to the Old Girls High, which was Washbury High. And those buildings were really dungeon looking. When I went to Charlestown, when they did the new building, the color, I mean like, it was like night and day, you walk in a building and you see color, your whole personality changes. It really does. And I noticed that a lot of kids, when they came into school, they were amazed that their personality changed. I said, it has to do with the colors that you're in. 
I said, the old building you were at, you were down because the building was down. It was drilled. I went to Brighton High School one day when I used to, I was in charge of security at one point in my life in the Boston Public Schools. And they sent me over to Brighton because it was a fight. And I walked through that building and I felt like I was in a prison. And that was high school. That's how depressed, I left out of there so depressed. I said to them, how do you all send kids in there to learn? I don't know how anybody can learn in that building. And I think the environment depends on the building. The brighter it is, the happier you are. The darker it is, the depressed you are. Does that help you? We haven't, we haven't solved it. The question was, how do we attract developers for the, the housing that we produce on the land trust? Um, there is no surefire answer to that at this point in time. Um, initially, we wanted to attract developers that had um, some, some hunger for serving communities in some capacity. Um, developers that were willing to come to the table knowing that we were going to try to generate um, costs that were affordable and how they could meet their margin of profit and give up a, a percentage of that profit for the sake of the project to be able to produce the housing. Um, and so that was a, a, an arm wrestling match that happened, it still happens now. Um, I'd say less now because developers are seeing the track record that we've developed over the years and see the relationships that we've built and so they want to leverage that, that opportunity. I'd like to say that they're coming in wholehearted, wanting to really do something good for the community. I'd really like to believe that. But at the end of the day, right, a business is a business and you're trying to make money. So how do you, how do you leverage both, right? You, you want to front like you want to do something for, for community. All right, cool, I'm going to play along. Talk numbers to me. Talk numbers to me. And this is where I get to enjoy putting on my architect's cap and talking to talk and walking to walk and saying, let's talk. Right? Don't show me BS floor plans. Don't tell me about the materials you're going to use because I'll, I'll call you out on it. Um, and it's no longer a fight for building quantity, but it's also now a fight for building quality along with quantity. Um, and so it's a, it's a constant conversation, but I think because of the portfolio that we've built, um, developers are enticed to want to work with us now because of, of, our, of our relationships. They know that if they can promote, we did this for the yeah. community land trust and we built these homes, that's all good. Show it off all you want. If the numbers talk right and they benefit our folks, I'm good. You can show it off all you want. Uh, but there is no sure, sure shot to getting to developers. Um, I do have you know, ongoing conversations with developers that approach me on wanting to build projects. Um, and again, my marching orders to, uh, are to figure out how will it benefit the community. If that question isn't answered in the midst of my conversations, then I'm simply not the person for the job. Um, that's what needs to stay intact, but I hope that answers your question. So on some of the slides, there was a, yeah, this gentleman noticed that some of the buildings looked like they were existing, they were either renovated or rehabilitated, and then some of the properties looked new. Uh, my response to the question um, was going to be that a lot of the, all of the properties on the land trust are all new construction. All of our sites were scattered, so you're going to see market rate properties and existing buildings mixed in between our, our properties. Um, but ours, um, the properties that we built over the past 30 plus years have, has all been new construction. Um, when we got the eminent domain authority, it was to be able to take over empty parcels of land um, that existed in the triangle. And some of that decision making process in terms of how the architectural aesthetics of the property would come to be were decided by the community. We have what we call a sustainable development committee at DSNI, and we've built over the years, we've created design standards. Um, to, to your point about like the colors, right? There's this, this, this approach to psychologically have an impact, whether it be in a negative or a positive way. Um, originally, when, when DSNI envisioned building properties in the neighborhood, there was a goal of building 500 units of housing in our, in our uh, neighborhood. Today we have 227. 
along the way, community members said, you know what, I want a backyard so that I could have cookouts. And so over time, because of the carving out of backyard space for, for homeowners and residents as they wanted it, it obviously took away from, from space where we could have built more homes, but this is what the community wanted. Uh, we have design standards when architects or, or developers come to present before us and they show us floor plans. You know, um, one of the things that I like to emphasize to folks in the midst of this community land trust movement is don't forget to not just do the work, don't forget to empower and educate the people that you're bringing along with you so that when you're not there, they're able to carry the baton forward, exactly. right? Empower them, educate them. And so we have community members at our sustainable development committee meetings that say, you know, they look at floor plans and they'll ask the architect, how big are the bedrooms in each of these homes, right? We built a design standard that um, says any home built on the land trust, um, each bedroom can be no less than 100 square feet, right? By, by design code, you can get away with a 70 square foot bedroom space with a closet, right? That meets code requirement. Community said, we want 100 square feet. Why, why would you want 100 square feet? Because 100 square feet would have been enough in their minds what is enough to not only put a bed and a bureau in a bedroom for little Johnny and little Susie, but to also put a desk in that space. Yeah. Because education was important to folks, and so the, the ability to have room for a desk emphasized the push for education, to give them a space to yeah. be able to do their homework, to study, to, to focus on a path that would lead them to success. That meant something to the community, so it impacted our design standards where you, you show up at, a, at an SDC meeting with a, a bedroom that's less than 100 square feet, immediately the community said, you got to go back to your drawing board. I don't care what you got to shave on the floor plan, but each of those bedrooms cannot be less than 100 square feet. Um, and so this is all community-led and things that are, are baked into the process. I hope that, that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. um, well, one more question, and then I think we should wrap it up because I know people want to get home and have something to eat for dinner. I have a question about the, um, the north, uh, the borders of the triangle, the north, west, south, and east, because I can't really tell from um, the, um, the map, and I thought you mentioned something about Ovens Corner, so I wondered, is that the, the furthest uh, northern border, and then uh, southern is Dudley Station, is that it, uh, for Madison Park? I'm trying to, you know, visualize that. Yeah, so the, the Dudley Triangle is, is well within those uh, points that you mentioned. Let me go back to the slide, see if I can see it. This is probably better. So the larger outline is the DSNI catchment area, the area that the organization serves from a community organizing standpoint. And then the, the triangular shaped line in the middle is where we were able to get most of our uh, eminent domain authority for parcels of land that existed. And so the Upham's Corner project exceeds our Dudley Triangle. So it's a, it's a point of victory. We've exceeded the Dudley Triangle parameters and are now getting parcels of land outside of the triangle. So a testament to, to my predecessors and the victories that we've been able to achieve over the years. Um, but the outline, the, the larger outline, does encapsulate the Upham's Corner area, but it's more of the service area for the organizing part. The, the physical build-out is just the, the triangle. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay. And the other part of my question is, um, do the community members, um, are, are they asking the um, DSNI to, uh, to help them get more affordable housing? I mean, is there still a need for that here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they are still asking. And, you know, part of what I do on a daily basis is, is, is other than managing the portfolio that we currently have, I have almost bi-weekly meetings with the Department of Neighborhood Development to talk about parcels of land that exist that DNI may be able to buy so that I can fold it under the land trust model. I then, you know, put on my architect's cap and try to figure out how to talk to developers, how to talk to folks from the city, how to leverage um, subsidy dollars to build projects so that we can then build homes and then market them to low to moderate income families. And, you know, we go through a process where once we get the land, we will have meetings with the community, and we'll ask, what would you folks like to see? One of the larger sites left on, you know, in the land trust is a 14,000 square foot site, and the community voted that they wanted to see a mixed-use commercial building on that site. So 
So now my marching orders are to figure out how to work with a developer to build a site that creates innovation and incubation spaces for entrepreneurs, how to extend services for the school that's across the street, how to build smaller cafe businesses and help them get to the next level. They wanted to see mixed-use commercial, so I'm looking to bring that to the neighborhood. Again, all led by the community, and once they speak, I get my marching orders to try to carry out. Yeah. Oh, please join me. Uh, thank you, everyone.